On a Wednesday excursion, when I was a little girl, my father bought me a beaded wire ball that I loved. Its hinged wires traced the same pattern of intersecting circles that I had seen on the globe in my schoolroom, the thin black lines of latitude and longitude. As we strode up Fifth Avenue to Rockefeller Center with me on his shoulders, I remember we stopped to stare at the statue of Atlas, carrying heaven and earth on his. The bronze orb that Atlas held aloft, like the wire toy in my hands, was a see-through world defined by imaginary lines. Even as a child, I could recognize in the graph paper grid imposed on the globe a powerful symbol of all the real lands and waters on the planet. Lines of latitude and longitude remain fixed as the world changes beneath them, with national boundaries repeatedly redrawn by war or peace. Any sailor worth his salt can gauge his latitude well enough by the length of the day or by the height of the sun. However, to learn one's longitude at sea, you need to know what time it is aboard ship and also the time at your home port. Every four minute difference between the two times indicates one degree east or west of longitude. This information so easily accessible today from any pair of cheap wristwatches was utterly unattainable during most of human history. On the 22nd of October, 1707, Admiral Sir Cloudsley Shovel summoned the captains of the British fleet to his flagship, the Association. That morning, he had ordered the execution of an able seaman. The navigation of His Majesty's ships is the sole concern of His Majesty's officers. The crime was keeping a private Every reckoning of the ship's position and publicly disputing compass. the Admiral's calculation. Ball of bloody twine! Every damned instrument in the possession of any seaman on any ship under my command confiscated. Any further questioning of our position will be treated as an act of mutiny and dealt with accordingly. That clear? Now, by my reckoning, we are here, 30 miles off the coast of Brittany. Gentlemen, what are your figures? 30 miles to Romney, sir. Captain Ainsley? Uh, the same, sir. Uh, where did the late able seaman Marston put us, Captain? Uh, here, sir. Ninety bloody miles away, in the Isles of Scilly. your vocal cords, you can speak, if you choose to. For God's sake, you're not like the others out there. You're an officer in His Majesty's Navy. Four years' service, exemplary record. You're expected to set an example. Broken, I'm afraid. I keep meaning to get it fixed. Fiddly bloody things, aren't they? I think I'll stick to human beings. On the 
honorable members who mourned with us the recent tragic loss off the Scilly Islands of four of Her Majesty's ships and 2,000 wretched souls therein, under the command of Admiral Sir Cloudsley Shovel, will be pleased to know that Her Majesty's government is to offer a reward. A prize of 20,000 pounds to any man offering a practicable and useful solution to the problem of finding longitude at sea. A board of longitude will be set up whose sole business will be to investigate any serious suggestion and finally it is profoundly to be hoped to award this prize. Thank you, gentlemen. Much better. I'll see you all on Sunday. William, you wait here. What do you think, Sir Charles? Extraordinary. Could you hear the difference? Mr. Harrison, does it matter? The sound is beautiful. Uh, could you spare me a moment, sir? Of course. I mean, it's not just beautiful, it's divine. That's where the beauty lies. Each note on the scale is calculated by mathematical formula, based on the circumference of a circle, you see. Uh, almost. The step between each note is composed of larger and lesser intervals, each derived from pi. It is divine, because for the first time we are listening to music as the Lord intended. Cecil! Oh, leave him, darling. He's been in the car for ages. A long journey for a little boy. Cecil! Especially to look at a silly billy old clock. Oh! Is that my stable yard clock? Yes! It's being adjusted. Does it work, then? I have it to under five seconds a month. Oh, but that's absurd. Sir Charles, if we had funds to produce a small pamphlet, I've already prepared an outline of the text. Inexpensively printed, it could be made available to every village choir in the country. I showed it to an American gentleman last summer. He seemed rather disappointed when he saw it, as I recall. These partitions wouldn't have been here in Harrison's time, of course. But he probably did some work on the panelling. He was a carpenter by trade, you see. Yes, I know. This way. How can you tell if a clock is running five seconds faster or slower? My own pendulum clock is adjusted to one second a month. Oh, no clock could be that accurate. Mine can. John? What's he doing? Good day, Mrs. Harrison. Sir Charles? Sir Charles was asking about the choir. Where's William? Oh, dear. Look how it just touches the wheel. Hardly using any energy. It's named after an insect. A grasshopper escapement. It's funny. It's 200 years old. Built before Nelson was born. And can you see what it's made of? Wheels. Wood. It's made of wood. Darling, we're going to be late and Jocelyn's starving. You close that door, I'll close this one. William? What did he say? He said he'd think about it. In yet. Is it accurate? Well, it wouldn't be then otherwise, would it now? No, I, I suppose not. It doesn't need oil, you see. The wooden bearings just loop.